Is this uh, legit? Legit, he has to. <laughs> So this one was kind of guided by the question of what is the optimal diet for pro wrestlers, which is something I get asked a lot, but then I asked you to send in your questions and I got 14 back. So this could be a long and very detailed chat. Hopefully uh, it seems like a lot of the questions will be answered by that first overall question, which is a very broad one. Welcome back to another episode of World Beater Wrestling and this one is one I'm super excited about because it's answering your questions and I got a ton of great questions all about diet, nutrition and training and of course I'm here with my fellow untouchable Marcus Pitt who is also actually the owner of Progress 365. Now do you want to tell us a little bit more about Progress 365? I know a lot of the EPW crew, a lot of Aussie wrestlers and even overseas wrestlers have gotten onto you and your training. So yeah. tell us a bit more about what you do offer. Most definitely. So Progress 365 is a uh, online coaching service. So it's not in actual physical coaching one-to-one. -one. It's all online uh, where we individualize, specialize um, training programs and nutrition plans. Uh, at the end of the day, I'm working with my clients to work towards their goals, their specific requests and whatnot. And it's, it's not me being a, a martyr. I'm not trying to direct and dictate exactly what we're doing. I'm working with my clients and with the individuals that are requesting to be coached by me so that we can move towards their goals. But with them in the same breath, uh, learning and being educated in the realm of training and nutrition so one day they can go off and do their own thing. Absolutely. Uh, that, that's the one thing I was going to say because I've been using Marcus Pitt for my coaching for a long time even before he had this company uh, just for his knowledge but um, just in terms of the way that you educate people to then I guess it's the same as you know teaching a man to fish yeah so yeah. that they can then go on and catch more fish rather than just kind of giving them a bill and end or product that they have to follow so uh, by training under this progress 365 program it's actually allowed me to then go on and, and create my own programs and direct my training wherever it needs to go just tipped Stupid windy microphone tipping. There we go. That's a bit better. So the first question is, what is the optimal diet for pro wrestlers? Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll give a little bit of my thought and I'll, I'll certainly get you to give uh, a deeper analysis because you are the, the man of knowledge. But um, the one thing that I know from, from my experience in pro wrestling and dieting and all the rest is that compliance is number one and something you can stick to is going to be the best for you because consistency is key. It's something I say a lot on these episodes. But but what say you? What, is, what do you think would be the optimal diet for pro wrestlers, whether it's keto, intermittent fasting, uh, flexible dieting? What have you got? So like exactly what you mentioned before, like what is the optimal diet for a pro wrestler? It's such a broad question. What are you trying to achieve? Are we trying to achieve weight loss? Are we trying to build muscle? I don't specifically think there is a optimal diet for pro wrestlers. At the end of the day, it really does depend on what you want to achieve. What are we looking to achieve? Are we looking for fat loss? Are we looking to lose weight? Are we looking to gain muscle? Um, and as you mentioned, different types of dieting, such as intermittent fasting or keto and some, the main thing, the biggest thing for me is adherence, is compliance, is consistency. There's a, there's a wonderful uh, quote that I hear all the time, and consistency is greater than perfection. So many people are chasing optimal, perfection, what is the absolute best, when at the end of the day, what we want to be doing is setting ourselves up for success by being able to follow a diet that suits our lifestyle, that uh, initiates the results that we're trying to achieve and that we're then able to be consistent with over a long period of time. Sure, sure. And I, I suppose a lot of, with this question being so broad and open, like you said, it could be about body composition and, and your physique, your aesthetics, which I assume a lot of people are meaning when they sure. ask this question. Sure. Uh, but it could also be about performance. So are there any... Uh, are there any downsides to uh, certain diets for performance? Any that you see may be the best for performance? Yeah, sure. So I personally, and and please, keto crowd, don't don't 
destroy don't World Beetle him, Wrestling. Please. Yeah, don't, don't, don't blow him up. But for performance purposes, I do feel as if the keto diet is a little lacking in that area just because of all the uh, peer-reviewed journals and the scientific literature that's currently coming out in regards to carbohydrates and how well they do fuel performance in the gym during our workouts. Uh, which is obviously a very, very important thing because our training in the gym is the stimulus towards whether we're maintaining muscle, if we're in a, in a dieting phase where we're trying to lose weight, mm -hmm. or whether we're training hard enough when we're in a muscle gaining phase, so when we're trying to eat more food than our body actually requires. Uh, so the, the carbohydrates are for fueling our performance in the gym and then post-workout when our body is in a... Uh, uh, it's obviously in a, a very vulnerable state and we need to recover. Carbohydrates are the best tool for recovery purposes. So then we are replenished. Our glycogen storages, which is the essentially, let's use layman's terms, it's the energy that stores in our body and that uh, refuels inside of us to then be able to allow us to again uh, perform well in the gym in our following session. Sure, sure. And I, I guess the one thing that you initially so many years ago explained to me, which really put a new perspective, was that all diets are based on the foundation of calories in versus calories out. So uh, if you're consuming more calories than you're burning, you're going to put on size, hopefully, uh, a little bit of muscle, a little bit of fat, depending on your balance of protein and all the rest. And if you're consuming less than you're burning, you're going to burn muscle and burn fat. Uh, so there's no magic pill. It's keto, intermittent fasting, um, if it fits your macros, whatever you're going to do, it's all based on can you keep it up, uh, particularly at the level many are at where they're still beginners to dieting and, and still trying to find their way. So yeah, really good point with that one. I think that'll actually answer quite a few of these questions. Uh, question two, so this was a good one. Uh, what is a good diet for the skinny fat body type who's looking to put on some more muscle? So the best practice, I guess, for body recomposition, um, no longer having the skinny arms and fat belly and, and trying to get to a state where I guess you have lean waist, big upper body, big legs, uh, whatever whatever you prefer. So yeah, what, what do you think would be the best practice? Most definitely. So I think like with something like that, uh, a lot of the times we need to look at the individual foods that we're actually getting in. So looking at something called macronutrients. Now guys, if you don't know what macronutrients are, there's three major macronutrients is your proteins, your carbohydrates, and your fats. Uh, now, a lot of the time, people aren't aware of the macronutrients that their bodies are actually intaking because they're not keeping track of the calories that they are actually eating. Um, now, obviously, calories are what, um, sorry, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats are, are what make up our calories. Um, a lot of the time, it's actually really like dialing in the amount of protein that we're eating because sometimes, yeah, we may be skinny fat, but, but what calories have we got coming in? We could have a, an absurd amount, like large amounts of fats and carbohydrates. And yeah, that's great and all, but the main uh, macronutrients for building muscle and sustaining muscle tissue is protein. Sure. Uh, so something like that is actually a really handy tool to really start um, focusing on what we're actually consuming and whether those protein levels um, are actually sufficient enough for us to even be in the first place building muscle or at least maintaining muscle. Now a quick one for that one guys, if we're, ever, if we're at home, for, for people watching World Beta Wrestling, uh, if you're trying to work out what the optimal uh, protein intake should be for an individual who's trying to either maintain muscle tissue or trying to put on more muscle tissue, we'd be looking, and especially for us folks in Australia, we're looking at 1.8 grams to 2.2 grams of protein per kilo of body weight, okay? So let's say, for example, uh, like we've got a 90 kilo person and he's trying to um, find an optimal range for being able to either maintain or put on muscle tissue. So we're looking, let's go simple guys, 90 times two for protein, you're looking at 180 grams of protein per day is what you should be aiming to get. Sometimes a lot of the time by doing that, by by being on the right training program guys and then consuming the right amount of 
the mm. right amount of calories being protein, which we're talking about right now, that can really, especially if you're quite new to training, that, those couple of changes there can really change our body composition. Um, but for guys who are quite um, advanced or maybe they've been training for a while and they, they, they're aware of their dieting, they're aware of calories in versus calories out, they're aware of macronutrients, perhaps we're not getting lean enough. Now, yeah, it's a really um, unfortunate thing, but we all have different body types. Unfortunately for myself, all my fat gets stored in the old belly. Um, and that's just the way it is. My arms get smaller, my chest gets smaller, my legs, everything else gets so much smaller if I'm in a dieting phase, so I'm trying to lose fat guys, lose weight. Everything gets smaller before my waist finally starts to go down. And that's just my body composition. Everyone's an individual, guys, and it works individually for everybody out there. Uh, so unfortunately, a lot of the time we do need to get those arms to be a little bit skinnier. We do need to let that chest get a little bit skinnier before that waist comes down. And then we may be getting ourselves in an optimal range where we can start pushing towards getting ourselves into a calorie surplus. So we're trying to build some muscle tissue, guys. So we want to be, and it's all about your rate of gain, okay? So a, a good rate of gain for those out there where we're, Putting on a good amount of muscle tissue, and like uh, Slater said earlier, you will also always be putting on uh, a partial amount of fat tissue, okay? So we've got our muscle here and we've got our fat here, and it's slowly going to come up, but eventually, when we've put on so much muscle tissue, eventually that fat tissue is going to start creeping up. Unfortunately, guys, we can't, we can't uh, gain muscle and build muscle forever without, without no uh, no fat tissue catching up because muscle just doesn't uh, grow forever in a day. Of course, we'd all be supermen. Uh, so Particularly for natural Most natural, certainly. Uh, Absolutely. Athletes. Absolutely. For sure. So in that regard, guys, you've, you've got to look at all those specifics. Uh, you've got to make sure that you're at the right starting level to be gaining some muscle if that's what we're trying to achieve, especially mm -hmm. for that skinny fat look. Um, we've got to get that tummy nice and flat and stuff so then we can start to gain up we can put some uh, mass on our arms and chest, as well as our tummy, unfortunately, coming up as well, because that's just part and parcel sure. of the process. Yep. Yeah, I mean, that's it. You can't, you can't spot reduce, as they say, so you can't do a bunch of sit-ups and burn the, uh, the belly fat, unfortunately. But yeah, that's a really uh, clever way. Just requires a bit of patience, mm, I guess. A lot, of, a lot of patience, yes, uh, as we've lot. found out over the years. Uh, question three, are cheat days or meals important, or do they do more damage than good? And I've lumped this with another question, which was how often do you have cheat days mm -hmm. uh, and how do you maintain a diet? So uh, I guess we already kind of spoke about calories in versus calories out. Um, are cheat days and meals exempt from the calories in, calories out? I think it, it really just depends on your goal. So let's get one thing straight. Let's, let's get cheat days and cheat meals out the window yeah. um, because as soon as we talk about cheat days and mm. cheat meals, everybody looks at it and frowns upon it and, and, and it's if it's like a, a bad thing. Yeah. Sometimes our bodies need something which we like to call like a refeed or um, we take uh, like a maintenance sort of phase where our body weight isn't going up and our body weight isn't going down. We're just sitting at homostasis, guys, which just means we're sitting still, we're, out, we're maintaining our weight. Um, so talking like when people say to me, oh, is a cheat day okay? Is a cheat meal okay? What are we talking about? Mm. Well, a lot of the time we're talking about pizzas and burgers and cakes and chocolate and stuff. And that's all well and good, guys. A lot of the time when we're in a dieting phase and we're feeling really flat, we're really low on energy. And let's say we've been really consistent. We've put in a lot of work. Let's say we're like 10, 10 weeks into a dieting phase and we're feeling really flat, we're feeling low in energy, energy and stuff, maybe we decide to have a little bit more of a refeed day. So instead of being on our, uh, our calorie deficit, so instead of having our fat loss, our weight loss calorie intake, maybe we bump it up to maintenance level intake for a while. So let's say for example, guys, my calorie intake to maintain my weight is 3000 calories, okay? But, my deficit intake when I'm trying to lose weight is 2,400 calories. I've just given myself 600 calories to play with for that day. So let's just say 
I'm craving a burger. Okay, no problems. We'll go down to McDonald's. We'll get our, our Big Mac or our Quarter Pounder. We'll enjoy a burger, which bumps up our maintenance, uh, maintenance calories, and we're sitting still, and we're not really doing any damage. At the end of the day, I think what you need to ask yourself is, what am I trying to achieve in the current dieting phase that I'm in? Do I have the potential or the space to, to have a day where I'm a little bit looser with my food and I'm enjoying some treats here and there? A lot of the time, like I was saying, when we're deep in those dieting phases, it can be really beneficial, not even physiologically, guys, not just for the body, but a lot of the time for our mental headspace. We just need a little bit of a reset so that we're not as food focused, we're not uh, having those awful cravings, which are in turn then putting us into some really uh, detrimental headspaces and stuff. Um, a lot of the times, yeah, we just need that mental break and sometimes a bit of a surplus of food, sure. a, a, a little bit of a treat here and there can really help with mm -hmm. things like that. Fantastic. Um, yeah, really good answer. Just being clever and smart and almost a little bit more organized about the way you do have cheat meals or, mm -hmm. or cheat days. Um, so the, the next part of the question was how often do you have cheat days and how do you maintain a diet? And I tied these together because I think I'll be able to answer them together. Uh, me personally speaking, I follow, I guess you would call it a flexible dieting plan. I've followed it for years and I find that it's, it's easy for me. Um, flexible dieting is making sure I've got my calorie target as well as my macronutrient target. I know my proteins, my fats and my carbs for each day or, or each week uh, in the long term. I know what I have to hit. So that's what I hit each day. Uh, that doesn't mean like a lot of people say, oh, I mean to eat Pop-Tarts all day or whatever. Obviously, if I'm gonna eat Pop-Tarts all day, high calorie foods, it means I'm gonna be starving for the rest of the day because I would have hit my totals super quickly. So by, by using that approach, I find that personally, like I eat a bit of chocolate every day. Um, I'll, I'll have a little snack or two and I don't really get cravings because of that. And when I used to go into a hardcore low carb diet, which is what I was, I was doing for many, many years, because that's what all the bodybuilding mags would say, you know, drop the carbs completely for a few weeks. And I found that by doing that, my cravings were so insane that I would just binge. So personally speaking, that's what I like to do. If I want a little bit of chocolate, cool, I will. I'll have it in moderation. I'll track it and make sure I still hit my targets. Uh, in a situation where perhaps I'm going out with family or friends and I know that this is going to be a blowout, we're going to get pizza, there's no healthy options whatsoever, uh, I'll maybe have a little bit of an intermittent fasting day, which means instead of hitting four meals a day, well, that's my end meal and I might only have one smaller meal and a bit of protein, maybe a protein shake or two on the side. And that way I'm I'm eating far less calories in the first half of the day and I'm making it up with that big binge at the end. Is it perfect? Absolutely not, but it's gonna minimize the damage, whereas had I done my usual four or five meals and then gone and, eat pizza, gone, gone and eaten pizza, I would have gone way over my totals. I would have felt terrible. I would have been spending the whole week feeling guilty. But again, that's just me. So that's the way I do things. There's no set cheat meal a day. I just eat how I wish making sure I'm sensible and smart about tracking it. And consistent. Consistent. Consistency is key. Very good. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, how do you feel about keto diet long term and or short term? We kind of brushed over it a little bit. Um, what do you think you spoke about keto diet not being optimal for performance? Yeah. Um, but long term, short term, what if it was just a few weeks thing? For whatever reason, maybe to trim down for a few weeks, or yeah, what do you, what do you, how do you feel about that? So again, like I think it really just it, it plays into that whole uh, context of do, does keto dieting fit my lifestyle? Does ke is keto dieting going to allow me to be a consistent mm. dieter? Will I be able to hit my calorie target, which we're hoping if we're trying to lose weight, mm. we're in a deficit. If that keto style, like eating that higher fats and like low to no carbs mm -hmm. is the way that we approach and ensures us of being as consistent as possible, absolutely, go for your life. I have absolutely no qualms, no concerns, and I'm not, I'm on, I'm not, no, I team no keto. Yep. I have no issues with that. It's such an individual thing. It's such a personal preference. And that's, that's key. You guys need to not listen to those uh, 
social media influencers, those coaches and such out there who completely brand keto as a no-go, as an awful thing. If that style of dieting, that way of eating ensures that you can maintain consistency, mm. then go for your life. I think it's wonderful. You did mention in regards to performance um, uh, like situations. I feel personally for, for, for a, uh, a bodybuilder, so people guys who are trying to enhance their, uh, their body composition, we're trying, to, we're trying to build muscle or we're, tr we're trying to become bigger individuals, we're trying to lose weight. Um, I have tended to find that from uh, clients in, in previous past or from seeing it from other coaches' point of views, uh, carbohydrates are such a fantastic performance enhancer. <laughs> natural performance enhancer in regards where they really can um, set up the body uh, for some really fantastic um, uh, performance in the gym, in ensuring that our training quality is of a high nature. Uh, when we're going into the gym with minimal, minimal amount of carbs, fats just aren't as good as ensuring performance is as high as it could be when we're intaking plenty of carbohydrates, mm. as well as our glycogen levels being restored post-workout, guys, post-training uh, sessions, which is then important, as I was mentioning earlier, to then back it up for the day, the, the next day. And also, guys, if you wanna learn about something uh, in regards to ensuring we're building as much muscle as possible and in the most uh, qualitative amount, like in the qualitative sort of way, uh, look up carbohydrates and how they influence the body's insulin because mm. insulin is a really big proprietor for uh, building muscle, yeah. for ensuring muscle protein synthesis and all the ins and outs, all the scientific uh, uh, physiological things that are happening inside the body. For sure, definitely. And I think for those who aren't aware of what keto is and all the rest, um, keto is eliminating an entire food group, eliminating carbs. Um, and I find that uh, from speaking to people who have been able to maintain it and who enjoy it as part of their lifestyle, keyword is lifestyle, uh, they've enjoyed it because they don't have to track calories. Like I said, I love doing it. I find it easy. It's second nature at this point. But for some people, my wife included, finds it super stressful to always have to write down your calories and track your foods. Um, so eliminating a whole food group means you can not go crazy, but you can kind of eat normally eliminate the the carbs and you're still going to keep those calories low same with intermittent fasting you eliminate you know 12 hours 18 hours a day whatever of eating you limit your window to only six hours you're gonna eat less calories um, so again yeah as you said exactly what works for you is always going to be best what's the best way to keep muscle while on lower calories for shredding training wise so training wise being um, the way we train in the gym, I guess, cardio, weights, whatever. Uh, what is going to be the optimal way to train when on lower calories so that you don't burn your muscle and you, you maintain yeah. as much as possible? Yeah, sure. That, that's, that's a fantastic question. And, and, and the biggest thing for me, and essentially this, this question really targets being in a weight loss phase, being in like where we're trying to like get leaner, we're trying to... Uh, appear to be bigger than we are by getting rid of that fat tissue that we're, we're carrying, that body fat that we're carrying. Or out um, angling the host, as yeah, you were doing or, now. Or out angling the host. Um, <laughs> so in that regard, guys, nutrient timing can become a really big thing. Now, if you've never heard of the term nutrient timing before, it's the way we position our calories throughout our day. Okay, so now the first thing um, I would say is obviously in, ensuring, ensuring that you have plenty of protein okay now we talked about um the intake of protein that we should have on a on a day-to-day -day basis um to ensure our muscle tissue really does hold on and stick around in a fat loss phase guys in a in a dieting phase um muscle tissue can dissipate it can it can go because our body is in fight or flight mode we're not giving our body enough intake to actually uh, function in a physiological way on a day-to-day -day basis. We're not giving it the, uh, the amount of food that it needs to do all out of the normal everyday things that our body has to do. Mm. So in that regard, guys, we want to, like our body will take from our carbohydrates, it will then take from our fats, and then it will take from our protein. And when those things really get quite low in those dieting phases, when we're taking from our proteins, we may then start 
pinching a little bit of muscle tissue because that's where we're like pulling that protein from. Uh, so what's really necessary in that situation is to ensure protein levels are high. So for you guys out there who are uh, the bodybuilder-esque type of trainer, bump those proteins up to 2 to 2.2 grams of protein per kilo of body weight a day to ensure that we're not going to have that muscle tissue loss or to minimize it as much as possible, mm -hmm. as well as timing our carbohydrates, guys. So let's say for in, in this dieting phase, we've got 200 grams of carbs a day for in, in this current uh, dieting phase. I would be looking to use a massive chunk of those carbohydrates pre and post workout. Let's say let's say we use 70 grams pre and 70 grams post. Pre we're ensuring that the body is full of glycogen where we've got plenty of that energy storage ready to go and to ensure our training which is very very important to ensure the stimulus is great on the musculature that we're working. Uh, and post to ensure that recovery uh, uh, recovery happens, glycogen storages get full again, and we, again, as I mentioned earlier, we set ourselves up for that next day of training. Mm -hmm. With our training stimulus, guys, we actually need to be doing a little bit more than what we would normally be doing if we were maintaining our weight or if we were trying to build muscle. On when, that note, yes, I, was about, I was about to say, on that note, because one of the things I find a lot of people think is, well, they correlate sweat and a beating heart with shredding. So suddenly they start doing high reps, yep. uh, supersets, no rest, mm -hmm. and just speed through these workouts. When you say more training and you need to up the training level or intensity or whatever, is this the wrong way to go? Is there a better way to do it? Most, most definitely. I, I do feel as if it's the wrong way to go. We can fall into that point, uh, guys, where we're actually doing too much. So a lot of the time, guys will go into the gym and they'll do 25 sets of chest in one session. And that to me is just craziness. Mm. Uh, because by the time you get through potentially, guys, 10 to 12 uh, sets per chest for, for that one session, you can then, anywhere past that level, be potentially doing a lot of junk volume. Yeah. So it's a lot of like training where we think we're getting good mind-muscle connection. We feel as if we're like, we're still really using that chest. But potentially what can be happening, guys, is we can be using a lot of assisting muscles. Mm -hmm. We can potentially be using more of our triceps to be doing our chest work. We may have completely let that mind-muscle connection go out the window. So. Are we actually doing more work or are we actually just adding more and more fatigue to our already fatigued body because we're in a dieting phase mm. and we're getting no benefits but just adding fatigue to ourselves? And in, as you know and as I injuries. know, yep. injuries can occur yep. in that sort of regard. Mm. So trying to find the correct training stimulus um, if you're an experienced lifter, guys. Um, have a look at uh, a gentleman by the name of Eric Helms. Uh, he's got uh, the um, Principles of uh, uh, Training Pyramids by Eric Helms. Fantastic books. Really easy to understand books. Another company that I like to look at is a company called Renaissance Periodization and a certain gentleman named Mike Isratel. Mm. Uh, and his work on um, how the body adapts to training stimulus, to training volume, so the amount of training that we're doing is absolutely fantastic and he is most certainly worth a read because for me to go into that aspect right now would take up uh, yeah. the next 17 episodes of World Beater. Don't know if I have enough battery left on the old iPhone. <laughs> so very good, very good. But yeah, in general, as you were saying, um, s slightly higher volume on a dieting phase, but not crazy amounts higher but yeah read more into it if that's the way you're gonna go that's it for part one a lot of good content there so we're gonna have to spread it out next week on thursday you're gonna have part two we got some pretty interesting questions to come you won't want to miss it make sure you subscribe to worldbeaterwrestling.com hit the notification bell so that you can stay up to date with more about getting jacked give us a flex boom got angled he's out angled me there we go. he learned from the best good